So good evening, everybody, and good morning to Dr. Ian. It's a very warm welcome to all of you in this uh, series of international webinar. This is second of this type. So now I request Dr. Rajul to introduce everyone, everybody. So thanks, uh, Shifari, and let me share my slide. Is my slide visible? Yes, yeah, introduction. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So uh, the first uh, of our international speaker is Dr. Ian Pitha. He is a glaucoma surgeon and a researcher at Wilmer I Institute, Baltimore, John Hopkins University. Uh, he is a divisional education champion for resident education. And uh, he is one of the main uh, interest is uh, nanomedicine. So he is uh, working at the Center for Nanomedicine at Wilmer I Institute. Uh, and his focus is mainly in the various aspect of the uh, sustained delivery system, the nanotechnology, and uh, he is going to talk mainly about the future of glaucoma management, which involves uh, nanotechnology to a, a big extent. Then our second speaker is Dr. Sri Priya Srivatsan. She is a senior principal scientist and associate professor at Shankar Netralaya, and she will be talking about the the genetics in glaucoma management. That how what is the importance of genetics in glaucoma management. Then we are, the panel is we have eminent glaucoma specialists across the nation and I'm not going to go in great detail, but Dr. Chandrima Paul, she is a, uh, the secretary for GSI and she's a senior glaucoma consultant, uh, BB Foundation, Calcutta. Then you have Dr. Purvi Bhagat, she is the professor and head department of glaucoma, MNJ Western Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Ahmedabad. Dr. Sunita Dubey, she is a senior glaucoma consultant and medical superintendent, Strauss Charity Hospital, New Delhi. Dr. Sati Devi, she is a senior glaucoma consultant, Narayan Nitralaya, Bangalore. Dr. Rupali Nerlikar, she is a senior glaucoma consultant, Dinayan Mangeshkar Hospital, Pune. Dr. Parath Dave, she is a senior glaucoma consultant, Dave Eye Clinic, Baroda. Shefali, she is a co moderator and she is a medical director, Sri Jaya Clinic, Parikh Glaucoma Care Center. Uh, and me, I am Dr. Rajul Parikh. I am not going to go introduce all these faculty, the national faculty, we all know in great detail. So with all the pressure, I will invite uh, Dr. Ian Pitha to give his talk. So he has already given his uh, recorded talk. So we will play that. And after the talks are over, we will have the panel discussion. Um, I think just one thing I want to add. So today we are fortunate to have with us here MOS President, Dr. Jignesh Taswala, sir. So please warm welcome to you, sir. Yeah, and and, 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 and uh, bit, you know it was a um, uh, thanks, Dr. Taswala, for you know allowing this webinar to go under MOS Aegis, which yes. is uh, going to yes. provide you know a, a large audience to all of us. Absolutely, my pleasure. We so wish Dr. you all Ian, the best for the webinars. Yeah, thank you, thank so, you, sir. Uh, so audience. welcome. Um, my name is Ian Pitha. I'm an associate professor at the Wilmer Eye Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm also a glaucoma specialist and I run a lab on drug delivery uh, for glaucoma treatment at the Center know, for Nanomedicine at the Wilmer Eye Institute. I'm very honored to be joining you here today um, to speak about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, which is the future of medical management in glaucoma. And I'm, I'm honored to be joining you virtually, although I have to tell you, after two years of COVID, I'm getting the itch to do a little more traveling, and I really wish I could be joining you in person. These are my disclosures. None of them are relevant. Before I get started, I'd like to give a brief outline about what I'm going to be talking about today. In order to appreciate the, the future of glaucoma medical management, I think we have to look at the history and ask the question of, whether the role of medications in glaucoma medicate in management has changed over time. I'd like to give an introduction to several new IOP lowering medications that are exciting as well as approaches to sustained IOP reduction. And lastly, I'd like to talk on approaches to neuroprotection in glaucoma. And I'd like to end by describing some work that we've done at the Center for Nanomedicine here that kind of pulls all of these approaches together. This is a timeline of the development of glaucoma medications. It's adapted from a presentation by Dr. Wallace Allward in 2016 and is available online. 
um, and I think it's a very good presentation if you have any interest in it. So you can really see that over the past 150 years, the development of glaucoma medications has been a relatively slow burn um, with one medication class or a new medication coming out every decade or so. The most notable of recent history are the development of beta blockers, topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, uh, prostaglandins in 1996, and more recently, rokinase inhibitors. Along the way, there have been incremental improvements in our block medications. Uh, two examples are shown here, polypene gel, which extended the duration of pilocarpine medication, and also the Ocusert implant, which also delivered pilocarpine over five to seven days and was an implant that was placed or in the lower fornix of the eye. These incremental improvements have also taken on different forms. You can see that um, here we show three types of different prostaglandin analogs. Um, so the drug classes have been built out. And we've also developed uh, preservative-free formulations of many of our drugs for patient tolerability um, improvement. And lastly, ways that we've incrementally improved our medications have been by combining different medications together. I, I frequently use COSOPT in the management of my patients as well as the combination of bromonidine and timolol um, is commonly used in the United States. So if you look at the glaucoma medication timeline, there, it's been marked by major advances, which include novel drug classes that have been developed, novel targets that have been identified, and new formulations. But there's also been a lot of improvement through these incremental improvements. Um, building out a drug class, as in the prostaglandins, new drug formulations just to incrementally improve the delivery of the drug, and different drug combinations. Today, I'd like to talk about um, ways in which I think the next major advances in glaucoma medication treatment will happen. And that involves the identification of novel drug classes, novel targets for IOP reduction, and also neuroprotection, and new formulations that could really transform the way we treat glaucoma. But before we start that discussion, I think it, 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 it is helpful to step back and think about the, the context of medications and glaucoma treatment algorithms. So this is what a lot of algorithms look like uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, a patient would be diagnosed with glaucoma and you'd start them on an eye drop. If they progressed or their IOP wasn't lowered enough, you would add eye drops, which was uh, a good uh, way to get a little more efficacy or a little more IOP reduction. But if the patient continued to progress, you'd, you'd do a surgery. You'd probably do a filtering surgery. And when that started to fail, you'd add drops back. And when there were no more drops and the state patient was still progressing, you'd do more surgery. You'd do another filtering surgery or add a tube. And then when that started to fail, you'd add more drops. So this was a very linear uh, algorithm uh, in which eye drop uh, usage played a major role. Well, this is what my algorithm is, is starting to look like now. I diagnose a patient with glaucoma or ocular hypertension, and they, we could do an SLT, a laser trabeculoplasty, or we could add drops, or if they have a cataract, we might be considering a cataract extraction with a MIG surgery. And if any of those fails, uh, there's still a lot of options. If, if one laser fails, then you can add another, or you could take them to surgery, or you could add eye drops. Um, so instead of being a linear kind of algorithm, this is much more of a, a blossoming exponential algorithm. And drops and medications play a smaller role in this algorithm than in the previous one. And there are limitations of drops, and there are reason that uh, glaucoma medications are sometimes being replaced by alternatives that are safer um, than previous filtering surgeries, and also questionably or more, as or more effective than, than eye drops. And those limitations of eye drops are insufficient efficacy at times, not enough IOP reduction. We know that there are problems with medication adherence with all of our patients. Eye drops can cause a lot of sur surface toxicity. And there are also significant systemic side effects that are associated with um, some of our eye drops. Eye drop cost can be a major issue for our patients here in the United States. 
especially the long-term cost of having to sustain eye drop use for many, many years. And patients can have a lot of difficulty administering eye drops. One way to improve the efficacy of our uh, glaucoma medications is to identify novel targets in IOP reduction. Three very interesting novel targets are the rho kinases, TIE2, and the potassium channels. Real kinase inhibitors were really born from the discovery that targeting the trabecular meshwork cytoskeleton reduces outflow resistance. And this is what it looks like when you look at cells that have been treated by real kinase inhibitors. On the left side, you see a lot of straight lines or stress fibers within those trabecular meshwork cells that are shown here. And when treated with real kinase inhibitors, you see those lines disappear. Um, so it changes the cytoskeleton of these cells and reduces outflow. In the United States, uh, rho kinase inhibitors were evaluated in the ROCKET-1 and ROCKET-2 trials. Shown here is a comparison of natarsidil, rho kinase inhibitor versus timolol twice daily, and it was found non-inferior when natarsidil was given as a once daily administration. There were, however, some limitations to the use of natarsidil. Approximately 10% of natarsidol-treated patients discontinued therapy versus only 2% of timolol-treated patients. There was significant conjunctival hyperemia and um, corneal findings in patients as well. On the right side of the screen, you see a beautiful neoprene cast of Schlem's Canal performed by Norman Ashton in 1951. And while it probably forced open downstream pathways that are not physiologically active, this cast does demonstrate that we've known about the structure for years and that Schlem's canal is a gatekeeper for downstream outflow pathways. Now the angiopoietin TIE2 signaling pathway is necessary for development and maintenance of Schlem's canal, um, both its integrity and its function. And we know that single nucleotide polymorphisms in the angiopoietin promoter are associated with ocular hypertension in open angle glaucoma risk. And more recently, it's been shown that TIE2 activators lower intraocular pressure in preclinical models and are a promising novel class of IOP lowering medications that are being evaluated clinically now. This is the modified Goldman equation, which shows the different factors that contribute to intraocular pressure. Most glaucoma medications have primarily acted through uh, affecting one side of this equation by reducing aqueous formation or increasing aqueous outflow through the conventional or uveoscleral pathways. But no matter how much or how well those medications work, they can never reduce pressure below the episcleral venous pressure. Recently, potassium channel act openers have been identified as regulators of episcleral venous pressure. And a very recent publication uh, shown here shows that in three different animal models, uh, potassium channel activators were able to significantly reduce intraocular pressure through selective reduction of the episcleral venous pressure of these animals. So those are several medications that are in development that are very exciting, but I'd like to move on to approaches to sustained IOP reduction. Sustained or controlled release formulations for IOP lowering medications have the potential to address and overcome many of the limitations of current eye drop therapy. So eye drops are delivered in a pulsed manner, and this exposes the eye to super therapeutic drug levels for a very brief period of time in order to get the medication to the target tissue. Controlled release formulations aim to deliver medications within the therapeutic range for a sustained period of time. And this would eliminate limitations of adherence and also toxicity associated with eye drop use. There are different routes of administration of the sustained release formulations. Most medications now are delivered topically, but again, these medications tend to be cleared quickly and only briefly reside on the surface of the eye. Medications can be injected into the subconscious space, and this is a relatively safe uh, way to deliver medications, but there are ways for the medication to be 
taken away from its target tissue through the conjunctival and choroidal circulation. Intravitreal administration is another way to administer sustained release formulations, which carries more risks, such as retinal detachment, hemorrhages, and cataract formation. And then there are implants that can be placed within the eye, which sometimes require incisional procedures. There's an active pipeline of formulations for a sustained reduction of IOP. These include implants that are injected into the eye, implants that are placed during surgery, such as the glaucose eye dose, punctal plugs, and the bimatoprost ring, which is placed uh, in the upper and lower fornices without the requirement of a surgery or uh, injection of any medications into the eye. The bimatoprost SR implant, or Darista, is now approved for limited use in the United States, and it was evaluated in the Artemis 1 and 2 trials against twice daily Timolol. It was found to be non inferior to Timolol. Uh, the duration of IOP reduction could be quite prolonged after the injection of the last implant in this trial. And there was a small percentage of patients who experienced significant corneal endothelial cell loss. One of the advantages of this implant is that it delivered elevated dosages of medication to the target tissue, um, much more than eye drops typically do. And this could lead to possible alternate mechanisms of action due to this distribution. And here you can see that the levels of drug reaching the iris and ciliary body um, was significantly elevated in the Bimatoprost SR implant injected eyes versus topical Bimatoprost daily. Another potential advantage of this bimatoprost SR implant is that uh, there was a reduced dosage in the eyelids in the orbit, potentially leading to fewer side effects from administration of this medication. Another way to achieve permanent IOP reduction uh, would be through uh, genetic or gene therapy. So genetic alterations in the myosinin gene are associated with about 10% or greater cases of juvenile open angle glaucoma and a significant percentage of primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, the mutant myosilin proteins accumulate in these eyes. They lead to cell stress and trabecular dysfunction, which leads to IOP elevation. However, complete knockout of myosilin does not affect IOP and it doesn't seem to affect the health of the eye. There is a group that's used the CRISPR-Cas9 um, system to eliminate myosilin in genetic models of glaucoma, and this is in a mouse model. And you can see here that when they injected an adenovirus that knocked out myosilin, they got significant IOP reduction versus uh, control eyes, and that lasted for several months. So that's another exciting way that we could achieve sustained IOP reduction um, after one treatment. Now I'd like to move on to approaches to neuroprotection. And this has really been the next frontier for, for decades now. Current glaucoma medications aim to lower IOP, and that's the only modifiable risk factor that we have for uh, reduction of glaucoma progression and development. So this is the way our treatment algorithm works now. Uh, on the y-axis here, you have IOP, and on the x-axis, you have time and you want your patient to be in a green zone where the IOP isn't so high that the glaucoma progresses, but it's not so low that you receive complications or they have complications from hypotony. So at the, the site of that arrow where you in, initiate therapy, you want the, the pressure to be reduced and for that IOP to exist in the green zone for your given patient. Now neuroprotection changes the paradigm of treatment in which that green zone is actually increased. So instead of lowering, needing to lower the IOP uh, of your patient into the green zone, you could actually uh, enlarge the, the IOPs at which glaucoma doesn't progress. So this could be a really exciting way uh, to treat glaucoma and to, and to complement IOP reducing therapies for our patients. And this wouldn't just benefit patients who seem to uh, progress at very low IOPs, but you can see that it would really help any of our glaucoma patients who need better treatment. This is an incomplete list of approaches to glaucoma neuroprotection, 
Mamantine has been investigated clinically. It's an NMDA receptor agonist that showed no benefit in visual field progression versus placebo in a large phase three clinical trial at an estimated cost of, of approximately $100 million. This trial really highlighted the need for improved clinical trial design in neuroprotection studies. The neurotrophins, such as ciliar neurotrophic factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor are being investigated clinically. High doses of nicotinamide or vitamin B3 have been shown to be neuroprotective in animal models of glaucoma and have improved the inner retinal function in glaucoma patients and are being evaluated as a neuroprotective therapy um, in clinical studies. Here at Hopkins, Derek Wellsby and Don Zach found that the dual leucine zipper kinase inhibition confers neuroprotection in animal models of glaucoma. Recently, uh, it was found that expression of a subset of Yamanaka factors, which uh, induced a stem cell-like uh, traits in cells, conferred neuroprotection in mice. And lastly, an alternate way to confer neuroprotection is scleral neuroprotection, which is an active area of my research in which the scleral biomechanics is altered in order to, uh, to provide a protective shell around the optic nerve head. We found that systemic losartan treatment was neuroprotective in mice by altering the scleral biomechanics. And it's also been shown that angiotensin receptor blockers slow progression in older patients in a large retrospective clinical study. I work within the Center for Nanomedicine at the Wilmer Eye Institute, which is a collaborative effort between clinicians, biomedical engineers, and chemical engineers um, to develop improved glaucoma therapies and really therapies for any eye diseases. And I've been honored to be part of the center for the past eight years since I joined Wilmer. The CNM is a very exciting place to work in its short tenure, which is about a decade. A number of companies have come out of the CNM and they have uh, medications that are either FDA approved and in clinical use, such as Califel Pharmaceuticals and Inveltis, or uh, medications or therapeutic approaches that are in clinical trials currently and associated with the company shown here. I'd like to describe a project that I've done in collaboration with Dr. Justin Haynes, who's the leader at the Center for Nanomedicine, Dr. Laura Ensign, who is a chemical engineer who's developed most of this work, and Dr. Henry Su, a graduate student shown here with his beloved Corgi. Dr. Ensign developed a technology called Ocugel, which solubilizes drugs very well and improves drug delivery by essentially forming a, a bandage of medication that can sit on the cornea and provide sustained delivery. Shown here is improved IOP reduction with an Ocugel formulation of Azopt um, with the hypotonic 12% Ocugel formulation uh, offering improved IOP reduction versus other formulations that were delivered to the eyes, and these were in rabbit studies. Another area of interest that we've been looking at is uh, the use of melanin binding drugs to enhance their delivery and sustain their uh, duration of action. One drug in particular that we've been interested in is sunitinib, uh, which is a proven neuroprotective agent in animal studies. Dr. Ensign uh, combined uh, Ocugel and Sunitinib to create Sunitigel, which is an ocular eye drop which has been shown to protect retinal ganglion cells with once weekly dosing in rat models. So in the study, rats were given approximately four doses of Sunitigel separated by a week and underwent a glaucoma model called an optic nerve crush. And we showed that even with once weekly uh, student no gel application, we could confer retinal ganglion cell neuroprotection in this model. So she's found that student no gel can really protect retinal ganglion cells with this once weekly dosing by taking advantage of her Ocugel technology, which improves drug delivery and the duration of drug delivery, and also using the melanin binding characteristics of sunitinib to provide uh, an extended duration of action as well. 
So in conclusion, glaucoma medication development has occurred in giant leaps, and we've also seen improvement for our patients with very small incremental improvements in our medications. There are still novel targets for IOP reduction to be improved. Improved drug delivery is essential for the future of medical glaucoma management, and neuroprotection is an obtainable therapeutic approach. It's my belief that a combined and rational approach can significantly improve therapeutic results for our patients. And I'd like to thank you for your attention today. Thanks. So thank you, Dr. Ian. It was indeed a wonderful talk. So please stay with us. Definitely a lot of people will have a lot of questions with you, to you. So now we invite our next speaker, Dr. Shripriya, who is going to talk on uh, regarding the genetics, uh, role of genetics in the glaucoma management. Dr. Shripriya. So I'm good. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, okay. Am I audible? Yeah, audible, but your screen is not. Uh, you're not going to the 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 screen. Go to the slideshow slide mode. mode is not there. Yes. Just go to the slideshow mode. Yeah. And increase your volume also a little. Voice. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. I am just, uh, even though my uh, topic was on um, how glaucoma genetics is going to help in the management, I'm just going to brief you about uh, the uh, genetic update on the genetics of glaucoma and what experience we have on uh, testing these glaucoma patients. Dr. Dr. Shripriya, sorry to interrupt you. Can you increase the volume or maybe back end team, Mr. Anmol? Now, now, um, I'm going to uh, so, so other uh, Dr. Rajul, is it fine? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Am I audible? Okay. Yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, just a brief, brief introduction to the genetic disorder per se. We have uh, four different uh, types of classification for genetic disorder: the chromosomal abnormalities or single gene disorder, and uh, mitochondrial disorders and multifactorial disorders. So basically, uh, glaucoma falls under multifactorial disorder or the complex uh, disease. Even though we do observe that um, in certain cases, there are uh, familial type of glaucoma, like uh, following either autosomal dominant or recessive inheritance is also observed. So um, the associated risk factors with glaucoma, as you all know, elevated IOP age, family history, gender, ethnicity, and certain uh, other uh, ocular determinants like uh, central corneal thickness. And uh, uh, the uh, factor that uh, family history and ethnicity are uh, playing a major role in uh, predisposing individual for glaucoma states that there is a uh, strong genetic factor behind. So thus, uh, as uh, you are seeing here, you have the various risk factors, the racial ancestry. For example, the angloclosure glaucoma is more uh, common to Asians and compared to POAG, which is more prevalent to US countries. And we have both uh, POAG and PACG to be equally um, uh, prevalent. So, um, so therefore, uh, to understand the genetics of uh, diseases like glaucoma, there are uh, earlier Basically, a classical linkage analysis was helpful where you have a uh, typical pedigree with uh, multi-generation affected following any one of the Mendelian pattern. And using many markers, we were able to narrow down certain lo loci. And uh, in certain cases, like the uh, myosin gene, they were able to even map the specific gene. But uh, always uh, there are other uh, inherent uh, difficulties, like for example, there, there are very low and then uh, penetrant, very low penetrant allele, which uh, masks the typical uh, in, um, in classical uh, pedigree pattern in uh, complex diseases. Therefore, uh, other um, type, other strategies like genome wide association studies came into picture where we were able to screen the whole genome, the markers that are uh, spanning the whole genome. 
and then we were able to identify or narrow down many loci and uh, then came the uh, quantitative trite mapping where the uh, more than the disease per se you have the various clinical determinants like the um, cup dust ratio or the IOP and uh, other uh, clinical factors which are also heritable and therefore uh, many small uh, component or the uh, low penetrant alleles with the modest effect could put together, contribute, and then collectively uh, give rise to this disease. And that with that idea, quantitative trait map mapping based strategies came into an effective uh, uh, method for gene mapping this uh, uh, disease. And also nowadays you have the other uh, um, strategies like epigenetics based or even mitochondria with, in, with relevance to mitochondrial genome, the role of uh, genetics in uh, predisposing individuals with glioblastoma. So put together, all these strategies uh, help us in narrowing down uh, certain loci. For example, here you can see uh, for POAG uh, as a classical uh, linkage based analysis, there were GLCA1 to P loci that were mapped across various chromosomes, especially for POAG and uh, uh, JOAG. And then uh, we have other um, uh, genetic loci that are associated with uh, uh, glaucoma and its uh, various factors. So thus, the uh, trend moved from the whole disease per se to understand the end of phenotypes, that is the quantitative trials, as we have, as I have listed here. Uh, therefore, so with this, uh, it shows that there is a uh, need to understand the uh, genetic background for this for glaucoma basically because of the strong positive family history and also especially in condition like unclosure glaucoma where you have uh, they have observed that there's an increased risk in uh, first degree uh, relatives especially uh, with respect to this uh, ACV and uh, chamber depth and also the other uh, factors, axial length and others. So which uh, showed a strong heritable estimate. So which suggests that there's a strong genetic uh, predisposition uh, for these individual risk factors thus collectively making an individual to be susceptible for the disease. And thus, uh, as you can see here, there are many uh, genes that are mapped uh, for example, here for IOP, CCP, CAV, CBR, DA. So collectively, these genes interact together and thus making the, uh, I mean, giving rise to the disease. Thus showing, I mean, uh, depicting the complex inheritance pattern with a lot of genetic heterogeneity. Also, thus contributing to the clinical uh, heterogeneity that is observed. So, so here you can see some of the pedigrees that we have come across uh, uh, for uh, angle closure glaucoma, where you can see uh, people with uh, in a pedigree both occludable angle and closure glaucoma and also glaucoma uh, I mean other types of glaucoma POAG existing together in one uh, uh, pedigree and it was also shown that in a uh, population in South Indian population a study by Kavita et al. has shown that siblings of angle closure patient had more than 33 percentage of you know, PAC and siblings of those with PAC and PACG patients had a greater than 10 percentage of risk of prevalent PAC and PACG. So this suggests that the screening of the family members at uh, uh, are, is important to identify people at risk for the disease for an effective management for the disease. So even though we have these uh, um, this background that uh, uh, strong genetic predisposition there and uh, but many members affected in the family, yet we don't have a uh, single gene that can really pinpoint, especially for the isolated age-related forms of glaucoma, this POAG or PSG. For example, this known myosin gene, which is known to cause there's a common mutation in the uh, reported in the Western population, but unfortunately in our population, there's no single uh, founder effect uh, causing uh, uh, common mutation and uh, we have seen that there are only three to five percentage of the POAG cases have myosinin mutation. So with this background, so it is very difficult for us to just screen the myosinin gene alone and then uh, identify at uh, risk, especially when you have isolated case of the disease. So therefore, it, uh, genetic testing is important, especially in cases where you have a strong uh, family history where it will help in really the possibility of early diagnosis and management 
and especially for cases like ocular hypertensive and glaucoma suspect it will help warrant the follow up in individuals at risk for glaucoma due to the positive family history and also if we can identify the disease causing mutation we can screen the other family members to um, help in the uh, uh, prediction of at risk individual so here i am just sharing one pedigree where this is this pedigree is basically for uh, from a primary congenital uh, glaucoma case where uh, the with the strong history of consanguinity when many members affected so earlier uh, we, uh, when sipan b1 is uh, there was a only gene and then uh, we are able to do an uh, um, marker based mapping and then identify the risk predicting haplotype and then we were also able to show the disease causing mutation in this particular family and with this information we were able to screen this particular individual where the parents were married within consanguinity and we were able to show that the child did not carry the disease causing haplotype and that the mutation was also not identified so as i was mentioning genetic testing is helpful especially in those cases where there is a strong uh, uh familial um, i mean uh, multiple affected members running the family and especially for uh, cases like uh, congenital glaucoma and other syndromic uh, uh, i mean forms of glaucoma and uh, secondary glaucoma so these are some of the uh, genes which are tested for uh, other forms of glaucoma like the paxic gene, gene in aniridia secondary glaucoma developed in aniridia and myoc especially in uh, joig cases with multiple members affected following an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance and sipan b1 in congenital glaucoma and foxy and pitx2 for uh, other developmental glaucoma so uh, now it is possible for us to uh, either go for an panel based screening where you have all these uh, genes tested using an uh, ngs based panel and then we are we can uh, identify the disease causing mutation that can help in the other family members so it becomes important so this here i have just given you a flow chart of for genetic testing that we generally follow in our lab where we document so it is very important for us to document the pedigree of that uh, case with a detailed uh, history and then you do an uh, pre genetic counseling to these patients where you explain the a uh, detail about the test and then its pros and cons and then uh, either you can opt for an uh, genotyping by panel based method or direct sequencing especially in cases like congenital glaucoma either we can go for a direct uh, if you have a, a proper clinical diagnosis established so it will uh, we can go for an uh, direct sequencing of the sipan b1 gene or if you have uh, if you want to confirm the diagnosis you can go for a panel where you have the, all the uh, uh, developmental glaucoma genes that are uh, screened and then once you have the uh, data then you get back to the uh, family and if it is an uh, variant of unknown significance and then you ask for an uh, uh, testing for the other family members if they are affected or a co segregation analysis in the unaffected uh, parents if it is an uh, recessive disease and then uh, you confirm the status pathogenic status of the uh, mutation and then that helps in uh, identifying at risk individual for an effective management currently we have this option available uh, as i was mentioning either a direct sequencing or a panel based testing for those cases uh, uh, with uh, congenital glaucoma developmental glaucoma and for myosin gene and autosomal uh, uh, dominant uh, uh, pedigrees with the joag or pedigree so thus we offer uh, these types of testing in our uh, 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 clinic who are uh, mean the patients who are referred by our uh, clinician and this help them in i uh, uh, mean add on value to their uh, so this is in nutshell about our small experience that we have with uh, testing for uh, glaucoma genes in our hospital Okay, thank you, Dr. Sribriya, for a nice presentation. Uh, so we will uh, move to the uh, question answer. Um, we had two talks, very nice, interesting talks, and uh, uh, I would like to ask first, Dr. Ian, 
डॉक्टर यन आई थिंक देर लॉर्ड्स ऑफ न्यू थिंग्स वुड कम इन मार्केट इन नियर फ्यूचर द द द पेशेंट एदरेंस वुड बी सॉर्ट ऑफ टेकन केयर ऑफ टू सर्टन एक्सटेंड विथ दिस काइंड ऑफ लॉन्ग एक्टिंग डिपो इंजेक्शन और इम्प्लांट्स बट आई थिंक करेंटली वॉट वी अवेलेबल इज द टूरिस्टा द द बायमेटोप्रॉस्ट Yeah. But if I am if I am not mistaken, I think that at this point in time the FDA has approved only the single injection. Uh, yeah, only one you're, time. You're, yeah, you're exactly yeah. correct. Uh, Darista is approved for a single injection um, in the eye and um, in the anterior chamber. And I, I know Abvi and Allergan are doing further studies to figure out um, ways in which it could be used for a more extended period. I think one of the you know there could be some benefit right uh, putting the darista in as a single injection because there was a small percentage of patients who didn't require rescue um for a year or longer after stopping the study so um there is uh the theory out there the hypothesis out there um that darista by creating these very high concentrations of drug in the ciliary body and the iris has a different um kind of effect or a different mechanism effect that could last for a long period of time by causing tissue remodeling. But that's still something that's being tested. So, you know, for my patients, uh, personally, it's, it's a little difficult for me to recommend a medication like Darista um, when it's just one injection that could feasibly just avoid eye drops for a very limited amount of time. But hopefully, as, as things progress um, and other options come out, we'll have um options that can be uh used for a more sustained period of time and maybe darista in the future as well so so what are the other option you think would be more feasible uh from the the, the optimum glaucoma specialized ophthalmologist perspective that would uh come in the market and would be like we would able to give on the multiple uh, uh injections sure. or multiple... yeah so um, I, I think, you know, one thing I've always been excited about is the bimatoprost ring, uh, which has, has been um, published on by Allergan as well. And that's a, a ring that delivers bimatoprost that's put in the, around the eye, kind of as a contact lens in the upper and lower fornix. And that's been shown to be effective um, for months and also does not cause, um, or it does not involve injection into the eye. So, um, doesn't come with the same risk profile that something like Darista does. Um, and also because of its, its kind of large um, size, shouldn't fall out of the eye. So that's always been very exciting for me, these less invasive ways of delivering medication. And then another thing that's really been under clinical development, which hasn't been published on, but has certainly been pre presented in many uh, uh, meetings is uh, Glaucos's eye dose, which is a sustained release formulation that's put in at the time of cataract surgery, um, similar to the eye stent. It's kind of riveted into the, the angle and can re release Travaprost for a period of time. And that could be a, a nice way to um, continue to lower eye pressure um, in patients if you're going into the operating room anyway, um, because some of the other MIGS uh, surgeries uh, might not lead to as dependable as a, re a result as kind of, you know, delivering the medication over the next year or so. So it might lead, lead to some good results. I, I do think in order for um, these sustained release formulations to be adopted, they have to have a very low risk profile um, because you don't want to adopt additional risk um, and from um, having the actual procedure um, done, and they they do need to reproducibly work. So um, I don't think Darista has quite reached that that landmark yet um, with some of the endothelial cell loss that they suffered in, in the trials. Um, so, Just a uh, question to Doctor Ian regarding IDOS uh, after mm -hmm. the. The stain release part, I mean, after the drug uh, is gets over, do we have to remove it and then inject another eye dose into the eye? Uh, yeah, so, so I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, the trials that are being done right now, I don't think they're removing it. And, you know, I, I've moderated on some some 
presentations that were two years ago at this point, you know, with COVID and everything, where they weren't talking about removing um, the IDOS. But I, I think, you know, uh, how, how many of those could be accumulated in, in the angle over time? And would that cause any problems? I think that's a very good question. Or when I remove those, would, would I cause a hemorrhage or something in the eye? Um, I think those are all really good questions. Yeah. So uh, I think I, I would request all the panelists if they have any questions for Dr. Um, Ian, then they can ask, you know, and let's make it open. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Ian, yeah, uh, even the biometric first contact lens, the phase one trial has been cleared and I guess it is now into the phase two. So uh, mm -hmm. your uh, experience or inputs regarding the contact lens? Are we, the, the ring? The contact lens, the biometaprost contact lens. From which 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 company is making so? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was Mediprint. It was okay. a biometaprost uh, soaked contact lens, uh, and it was also a comparison to Timolol. Oh, I mean, the, so contact lens delivery of for sustained release is a really exciting um, prospect because contact lenses can actually kind of push the drug into the eye because you have the tear film underneath the contact lens. Um, I, I know that there are a number of companies and groups developing contact lenses for drug delivery um, and could deliver them for, you know, weeks, if not several months. I don't know the, the state of those, um, but I, I think those are, that's another exciting way for our patients to be able to manage their, their own medications, um, especially since so many of our patients use contact lenses anyway. Yeah. So uh, I have a question, like there are exciting novel delivery system, which are yet to come in India. Yeah. We have row kindness elevators. So what is uh, your take on them? Uh, when do you use them? Like as second line, third line, or yeah. what are the side effects you have seen because of them? Yeah. So I, you know, they're not a first line drug um, for me because a lot of patients have conjunctival hyperemia with it and they're bothered by it. And it's also, you know, expensive for, for patients. Um, so they are more um, a kind of a third line drug for me. I will, I will usually start a patient on a first line drug like Timolol or Latanoprost or one of the prostaglandins and then move on to uh, a combination drop if needed like Cosopt. Um, and then after that, if the patient is resistant to surgery or doesn't want to pursue surgery, I, I start marching down kind of the, the further line drugs. And right now, row kinase inhibitors kind of occupy that um, zone for me. Um, so is uh, Roclatan available, which is a combination of Medaprost and uh, row kinase yeah. inhibitors? Yeah, so Roclatan is available. Um, you know, in my personal use, it, it actually causes a little less hyperemia and, and patient uh, toxicity or ocular surface toxicity than Ropressa. And um, I do have a fair, uh, a population of patients who are on that. So um, I, I will usually start with uh, Latanoprost and, you know, my next step really wouldn't be Rock Latan for a lot of my patients, again, because it's, it's expensive. But there is an argument to be made to, to go from um, latanoprost to rock latan as a single once daily dose because patients would be you know more adherent with it. But again, because of cost issues with most of my patients, um, I, I, I don't do that. Um, but I, I think you know rock latan. I do have some patients who've come from other practices who've all, already gone through that and they're on Roclitan um, as a single dose. And I, I certainly continue it and they seem to be happy. Yeah. I have a question regarding the rock inhibitors. So mm -hmm. uh, like uh, what literature suggests regarding the rock inhibitors that it is protective to endothelium. But mm -hmm. we have seen in our patient that especially in the compromised corneas, we have actually mm -hmm. five patients out of, till now I think uh, we have given up to 56, 57 our patients. And in mm -hmm. five patients, we have actually the patient who developed a uh, corneal edema, typical pattern, you know, that reticulate or honeycomb pattern of corneal edema. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, it was, it was reversible. Once we stopped it within two to three way, way weeks, it resolved also. So what is yeah. your take on it? Because literature you know, suggests otherwise. 
I agree. I agree. So, you know, there, there's a lot of work on rock inhibitors and protecting the corneal endothelium. Um, we've seen a lot of corneal changes, and I'm sure you see a lot of corneal changes with rock inhibitors. And our cornea specialist, Dr. Bert Jun, um, is, is a strong believer that sometimes rock inhibitors cause the exact effects that you, you've described. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I agree. Um, I don't, I haven't, you know, avoided it in, in patients with compromised corneal uh, endotheliums. Uh, for that reason, but we do occasionally see this. And yeah, no, shoot, if you could, uh, if you're interested, you could shoot me an email and I, I can put you in touch with Dr. John because, you know, he's, he's, we've, we've been looking out for this in, in our practices of these patients who all of a sudden get this honeycomb um, pattern of corneal edema um, when we start rock inhibitors and it is reversible. Yes, yeah, so basically it's possible that these are different molecules because I think the molecule that we are using is some A A one three three two four something. Yeah. And so you use what using... is uh, for endothelium? Is it some different molecule? Because I yeah, think so... one sort. Uh, yeah. Yes. Please go oh. ahead, sir. Yeah. No. So you know we we use natarsidil, and you might be using um, something like r riposidil. No, we, um, we have both. We have both. No, no, no. We are also using natarsidil, and we have experience of riposidil also. But what I have seen. After first seven patients, only one patient developed uh, corneal edema. So, and then after that, we got uh, netasodil in the market. It is IV feel it's better than ripasodil. So, we are now prescribing mainly netasodil only. And same like third, fourth, or fifth uh, line of treatment. Yeah, yeah. The corneal edema, which we have seen, especially in the compromised uh, this thing, and what literature suggests is actually other way around that it is beneficial for the where the endothelium is damaged, like in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy or post cataract surgery corneal edema. So that yeah. is what uh, I wanted to know. If we think it's beneficial for the... No, no, no. That is what, what we have experienced is that whenever the cornea is compromised, endothelium is compromised in those patients, especially if you are giving this rock inhibitors, those patients are de developing this typical type of edema. Yeah. Not otherwise yeah. in other gene patients, but what literature suggests, otherwise, if you see the literature, there has published article in IOVS and cornea journals that yeah. it is endothelial protective. So yeah. it is the two different contradictory statements. That is what uh, actually in one patient, we prescribed netasodil thinking that this will improve the corneal edema, but it worsened. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the mechanism could possibly be. Um, you know, there, there's rock one and rock two, and those are widely expressed throughout the body, and they have all these different rules. Uh, roles, you know, they they are involved in cytoskeletal um, remodeling and the cytoskeletal response to to different stressors. So it, it's a very kind of a, a wide spectrum of activities that rock have, and it could be that inhibiting rock with um, you know transplanted corneal endothelium or momentarily stressed endothelium, um, it has a beneficial effect um, by, by changing cell migration um, and reducing their kind of pro-fibrotic um, uh, activity. But then sometimes if you inhibit ROC, it's you know, essential for, for the maintenance, maintenance of, of um, cell health. You know, too high of a dose of any drug can be toxic. So it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting kind of contradictory set of, set of evidence that we don't really understand yet, but we're seeing that too. Um, and I, I'm certainly not using rock um, after my cataract surgeries or anything like that to protect the endothelium. And I agree. Yeah. Could I ask? Yeah, yeah. Para, just one. Yeah, you said that you go for letter of prostaglandin this first line. Yeah, and we also do that, but we don't have nitrous uh, NO2 donating prostaglandin in India yet. But you have, so uh, latanoprost or latanoprost binoid, which one would be? Well, latanoprost, latanoprost. You know, not, um, not latanoprost. You know, the nitric oxide delivering um, medications. I, I I apologize for not kind of going over those. Um, they they they're still expensive for us, and you know they might lead to a very marginal. Um, benefit over latanoprost, but, you know, I haven't adapted those, adopted those widely in my practice. And I, I don't know a lot of people who have, um, it, it's a really exciting, um, uh, 
you know, theory um, in, in how they would have this beneficial effect. And it's really exciting pharmacology that's going on there, but clinically and kind of economically for my patients, I haven't really had a lot of experience with that. Right. Paraj, you wanted to ask something? Yeah, in continuation to the question, uh, both latinoprostine, Brunod, and uh, the root kinase inhibitors for that matter, uh, we have seen yeah. that, you know, to work better when the pressures, the baseline pressures are slightly on the lower side, not in very high yeah. pressure situations. Do you, do you think that these medications would be you know more appropriate for use in say normal tension glaucomas uh, rather than uh, our uh, normal you know high pressure glaucomas uh, and what is uh, your you know uh, uh, according to their place in your practice as of now when do you uh, when would you prefer to use them as say uh, instead of a third line treatment say a second line treatment or would you upgrade them uh, based on some specific clinical situations or it is what it will always remain as a third line uh, treatment for now? Yeah. So I don't think there's, I, I, you know, there is evidence that the row kinase inhibitors work better uh, in, in patients with a pressure below 25 millimeters of mercury. And I think that came out of the rock trials. Um, uh, but I haven't incorporated that into my practice in kind of having a row kinase inhibitor jump a, ahead of other drugs. Um, for IOP reduction, because, you know, I don't, I don't think there's, um, I, I think that's a really good point and maybe I should consider that further, but I don't think there's sufficient evidence that, uh, a medication like latanoprost, which, or timolol, which are first line drugs work less well at, uh, low pressures. You know, I, I think their row kinase inhibitors were found non-inferior to, to timolol, at, at low pressures. And I would imagine they're non-inferior to, to latanoprost at low pressures as well. But um, that could be um, a, a, a place where they would have a, 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 a better effect. I think I, I have to kind of revisit. That's a really good point. Um, Dr. Sitri, okay. would you like to ask a question to Dr. Rian? Then I have a question for Dr. Shripriya. Yeah, I just wanted to ask regarding the use in post eyes. There has been some uh, indication for use in post eyes because it's supposed to reduce the scarring. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you tried that? And do you think that's... Yeah, um, yeah. So I think that's, a, you know, there, there's, there's good clinical evidence that rho kinase inhibitors are antifibrotic, right? And um, we actually published on this a little bit from my lab. And they, they, they are very nice antifibrotic drugs. I, I really like, I would, I would like to say that I could use those, that those would be a good medication to use in post trab eyes, but it's also, you know, they cause so much conjunctival hyperemia and sometimes they make the conj look so angry um, that I, I haven't used it for that um, because, you know, in a, in a post trab eye, there's so much inflammation. I'm usually treating people with steroids and using hyperemia as a little bit of an indicator for how to titrate those. And I feel like if I added a real kinase inhibitor on there and all of a sudden the, the eye was red and angry, um, even if there was an antifibrotic effect, I wouldn't know what to do with it and how to kind of uh, adjust my, my steroid use and everything with that. Yeah. Have you used it at all as in, in post trab eyes? Yeah. Um, I think very, very few patients, but like you said, the acceptance level is really low. I mean, most mm -hmm. patients uh, just stop it after using it for a couple of days. Some of them yeah. last maybe a week or two, but uh, the dropout rate is pretty high Yeah, um, as I've seen it. Yeah. So, so I think hyperemia is one of the important reasons. Like I had one patient with AGV in one eye and other eye, I, had, I put patient on rock inhibitors. Yeah. And you will not believe me, patient never complained of sutures in AGV, that patient that it's, there was irritation. She kept on complaining, why my other eyes red? Because yeah. I think patient care, the relatives keeps on telling that why your eyes red. So actually she stopped medica medication, this were rock inhibitors, and she opted for the AGV in the other eye also. So you can yeah. imagine the congenital hyperemia. But otherwise, I think at low pressures, it works for some time if you want to avoid our surgery for some time that it, we can use it. Otherwise, at low pressure, it is good medication. It is one of the addition yeah. in our argumentarium. Yeah. So can no, I ask I think one question? Yeah. yeah, please, please, Dr. Yeah. Yani. No, I think it's a very exciting medication. I'm very glad these new classes of medications are coming out. I think the rho kinase inhibitors, you know, would are a great example of a, a medication that might do better as a sustained release medication where you're not exposing the eye to really high doses and maybe lower doses, we could get a really good 
um, IOP reduction without all these effects that are, are giving us a little pause in using it in our patients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other question or can I ask no, question? I, I just, just one question related to SLT because uh, you mentioned about the use of SLT. So I just wanted to know the indications and what stage do you use SLT in your practice? Yeah, so uh, that, that's a really good question. And if you asked me three years ago, I'd give you a different answer. But, you know, the light trial com coming out of the United Kingdom has, has made us um, reconsider where we use SLT in our practice. And usually if, if I see an ocular hypertensive or a person on who's just been diagnosed with glaucoma, my discussion now is kind of 50-50 on recommending that they start with eye drops versus SLT, because I think there, there is an argument for good IOP reduction in patients with SLT and potentially a, you know, improved quality of life with those patients. So I, I'm more kind of bullish or e eager to offer SLT as an alternative to starting drops when we diagnose patients um, because there is evidence of it. Um, and I can kind of recommend that um, more wholeheartedly with the, you know, the excellent work that came out of the light trial. What, what about you? Are, are you offering it we, more? We in India are not using SLT so often. Oh, because yeah. Several studies suggest that it doesn't work so well. But I mean, mm. I'm going to start SLT now. We just acquired it. So just wanted to know your views. So. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's tough because you know you see these studies and they get amazing results with SLT, and I feel like my results maybe don't quite um, end up quite quite as good. But it might. I have to go back and look at my results just to see if I'm being overly critical with my, uh, I, uh, with my results. So, Doctor yeah. Smith, actually, we are we are doing SLTs, but yeah. in mainly in early glaucoma yeah. and uh, open angle and early glaucoma when early you patients have one or two medication years. So, yeah. patient, if a young yes. patient, you want to avoid these, uh, you know, medications for a long duration or so, then we are giving option. A lot of mm -hmm. patients are taking option of SLT. Yes. Now, uh, can I ask question to Doctor Shilpriya? Yes, it's a very basic question on genetics because I think we are not much aware of the genetic part in glaucoma. So like if my patient has uh, open angle glaucoma, maybe both the parents have glaucoma. Now they want to know whether their kids can suffer from this disease or not. So is there a, any method where there are, is there any procedure by which we can counsel or what type of counseling we should do uh, to this uh, type of parents who wants to know who are... Uh, Congenital glaucoma, you know, yes, patients and we are counseling. But for this type of glaucoma, do we have any, like, where, how can we counsel these patients? And in case if you have to send, are there any some blood testing which can be done in any lab or so where they can know that whether their kids can have glaucoma? Yeah, both the parents have same type of glaucoma? Mm, maybe it's open angle glaucoma. See, if it is open angle glaucoma, as I was mentioning you, uh, in an autosomal dominant uh, uh, fashion if uh, the parents are affected the empirical risk is 50 percentage but uh, we have the myoc gene again the result is we as you know it is only three to five percentage we get the uh, mutation in these patients so even though you can opt for a myoc testing but uh, 95 percentage chance are there we might not identify the mutation also so in such cases we try to give an empirical uh, uh, risk that rate is a 50 percentage risk for the uh, sibling following in uh, autosomal dominant fashion. If it is a uh, congenital glaucoma, then uh, it follows an autosomal recessive pattern where both the provided both the parents are unaffected. And then you can opt for an um, uh, testing for sipon B1 if it is uh, just a direct uh, sequencing. Or you have uh, um, labs like MedGenome where they uh, screen a panel of genes which is involving even sipon even and other um, uh, secondary or developmental glaucoma genes, which can be screened. And based on the result, we can uh, check the uh, siblings also and the offsprings also. And then we can uh, know whether they will uh, get the risk. Uh, so, so which type of labs we can send these parents? Like for there is, uh, there has to be blood testing. and So uh, basically in our lab seasons, uh, uh, it is more uh, with respect to the cost. So screening one gene is not a cost effective in cases where you have a panel of genes and therefore 
Uh, you have certain labs like med genome lab and also in AIMS, I understand that they have this uh, facility to do the NGS uh, based screening like Gangaram Hospital in uh, uh, Lucknow. So they have these facilities where they can screen a many number of genes in one shot at a very cost effective way. But uh, if you are very much sure that this only uh, uh, congenital glaucoma, then uh, for example, in our lab, we do the direct sequencing for the cyp one gene and then we have chances, more chances that 80 to 90 percent chance are that we may uh, will identify the mutation. So in our lab, we do uh, outsource it to HedgeMoon lab whenever we have the need for a panel-based testing. If it is a single gene-based testing like a myoslin gene or an uh, uh, sipan b one gene, again, uh, we need to explain uh, this to the patient that the chance of getting them a uh, positive result has to be explained to them. And then based on their uh, consent, we can screen uh, these two genes by a direct sequence. Is there any okay. other question from the panel yeah. to Dr. Yeah. Shipali? Otherwise, we can open uh, our Shibali, questions. Yes. Shipali, can I ask a question to Dr. Ian? Yeah, and I think yeah, uh, Rupali also wants to ask afterward. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Dr. Yes, Ian, very good. nice presentation. Both the presentations were excellent. Just a little corollary of this. Uh, uh, Rokinus inhibitors to clear the corneal edema. Maybe that is uh, as a chemical keratoplasty. What is your view on that? Um, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with that, but uh, I don't, you know, I don't think that's reached kind of widespread use for it in 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 our Most division. Corneal or, edema, our department. Yeah. corneal edema, it works very nicely. That is what we have yeah. observed. Yes. Really, so your yeah. view on that. Anyway. Um, I, I, I think that's an exciting potential use for rho kinase inhibitors, um, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with it. So I, I think it would be great if we, we had medical, better medical treatments for corneal edema. Um, yes. And um, I've, what, is your, what is your view? Do you avoid carbonic anhydrase inhibitors? How, how much do you feel like that affects corneal edema? In, in... It, quite, it, it quite clears in the post-op cases, I started using it. Where yeah. we see that the corneal edema is not clearing with other agents, this works like magic. That's really? why I wanted to know your view, uh, whether you have a study on all this. No, so no, I don't have any the, studies on that. Keratoplasty yeah. have reduced in our end year at least. Where, uh, really? Una will be doing it. Or just too. once a day? Once a day, row kinase inhibitor? Twice a day, twice a day. Twice a day. Yeah, you're using okay. Ripa Sudin, Dr. Tasha. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ripa Sudin. Ripa Sudin. Yeah, okay. Repasadol yeah. is a very potent, potent rho kinase inhibitor. So that, that's fantastic. Actually, here in Baroda, the general consensus is that you know, rho kinase inhibitors for cornea do not work that well. So I don't know. The huh. cornea specialists are not actually uh, very avid users of this particular drug because they have seen that, you know, it doesn't, it is, it is not a magical uh, drug. Huh. Is that, that is their experience. So here, yeah. at least this part, we don't use it as often as uh, Dr. perhaps. Dr. Ramesh and uh, Dr. Jagdeep Kakadia is also working on a similar line. And it yeah. is uh, a very good uh, this thing, indication for uh, chemical keratoplasty. That is how it is. Wow. I think the are, are there... is compromised. Yeah, it should be avoided. I think uh, that is what ultimately what we have found. If the endothelium is compromised, this will cause further edema. So in yeah, those in, cases, we could avoid it. From glaucoma so point of view, Rupali wanted to ask to Dr. Supriya, to Dr. Supriya, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask her uh, what the thing is about angle closure glaucomas. I have three families where there are three generations affected. Like the youngest person in the, the third generation, they're affected at 27, 28. So how do we uh, counsel these patients and what kind of tests we can do for angle closure glaucomas? As you told him, madam, for angle closure glaucoma, we don't have any uh, specific gene identified. Now only we have, like, for example, the first report from our hospital along with the uh, as consortium as a part of concession, we have mapped the five loci and then we have other uh, uh, reports on that. But there is no pinpointed gene like you have for uh, congenital glaucoma or uh, PAC6 for anemia. So there are no such uh, uh, gene specific for angle closure glaucoma that has been identified and then yet uh, available as a uh, test for these patients. But as I was mentioning, and, you, and if it, there is a um, uh, three-generation three, mem three affected, we can give an empirical risk of, say, this 50 percentage for the uh, uh, offsprings of an uh, affected parent. 
so we can give this risk and then uh, based on that they can be asked for a uh, follow up i mean uh, constant and, follow up for the do you have a registry of some kind where you can have a record of such such kind of family so that eventually when you start maybe running a, a why do as an in house we have ma'am uh, the patients are referred to uh, a genetics clinic if there is an if they have an, a strong family history and then we document their pedigree and then maintain and then we uh, where whenever wherever funding is available we uh, do an uh, whole genome uh, like based on an exome sequencing okay. or a genome wide sequencing we do take it as a research part but not as an uh, routine testing Okay. Dr. Shripya, how would genetic testing change the way clinicians, you know, approach a patient? For example, even if you know you get a positive uh, genetic screening for a particular gene, uh, which is more likely to cause glaucoma, how how would it help a clinician to tell them, you know, as as to how would it affect our counselling on our part? Because I that could pretty much remain the same, uh, irrespective of you know what the genetic uh, testing results are. So you, how how do you think our counseling should change depending on you know uh, the results of say a genetic uh, positive so maybe gen- you can test. you can advise the patient for and as i was mentioning you constant follow up we had one uh, pedigree uh, where there was uh, four uh, generation affected with uh, juvenile open angle glaucoma but it was a, a part of an uh, congenital uh, microcorea that is a meiosis syndrome where they had uh, all the three myopia uh, juvenile open angle glaucoma and also the um, pupillary uh, uh, dilation problem so in this pedigree we were able to identify the myosin mutation but irrespective of the fact that this is not the uh, gene for uh, congenital microcorea but this information was helpful for that uh, family and whenever the patients uh, visited uh, the clinician always they advised for the other uh, family members to uh, have their uh, um ocular examination and also they were advised for the genetic testing for the new members so that we can uh, help in the early uh, detection of this i think that 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 part most of us i mean we do it uh, as a regular thing that you know if you have a positive family history you want always want to tell the patient you know get your relatives checked and we want them under a closer follow up so, but unfortunate thing is here we do not have like for the other uh, uh, retinal disorders irds where we have a panel of genes and there are 80 percentage chances that we do identify the mutation and then offer the uh, prediction or the uh, clinical whatever advice management advice the doctor gives but unfortunately for glaucoma we don't have such an uh, um, panel of genes which can pinpoint it yeah, if it is available then it will be of uh, I think mm-hmm. presence of genetic counselor is very very important. Have a you know a genetic uh, yeah, yeah. So Rajiv, can you ask now? Uh, yeah, so we can start the panel discussion. I I think we had interesting discussion about these two talks, and um, we are running late, so we'll have few questions, basic questions for the audience, uh, because this was uh, all uh, high tech discussion. and we the general ophthalmologist i think we should have just basic discussion so i have few questions i had actually had lots of powerpoint but i'm not going to talk about it so sunita if you can just talk that you know uh, uh, the if the patient comes with ocular hypertension how will go about it the management perspective and now how you use the the oats data uh, in your clinical practice so uh, we have a landmark study ocular hypertension treatment study so our the protocol is based on that or only so uh, the study identified uh, certain risk factors that if the iop is more than 27 28 if the corneal you have to uh, uh, you know look for the risk factors the corneal thickness the um, intraocular pressure uh, the psd and the changes in the visual fields and uh, family history so i think if you have uh, uh, these risk factors then the threshold for treatment is less so what uh, we do is that uh, uh, the iop uh, is very very important uh, it has to be correlated with the corneal thickness so if iop is more than 27 28 then even if there are no other risk factors you are going to treat the patient of ocular hypertension because uh, uh, it's a threat to the ocular vasculature uh, and it can lead to crvo or you know vascular occlusions uh however if the iop is less than 27 28 uh, 
then you have to look for uh, the risk factors. If your cornea is 10, if there's a family history of glaucoma, or if the uh, you know, um, uh, PST is little less, uh, or uh, any other risk factors, uh, then I think you can consider uh, treating this patient uh, depending on the risk factors. The vertical CDR is more than 0.6. That is another risk factor. Yeah, so CDR is more than, so that is okay. another. I think we all agree that all ocular hypertension patients do not require treatment or only certain high-risk high ocular hypertension we will treat and I think Sunita has uh, described very well. Uh, Dr. Purvi, you know, um, when the patient comes first and we assess, uh, do a comprehensive eye examination, uh, what are the factors you consider for the target pressure uh, in deciding the management? Yeah, actually, uh, the target pressure, it uh, doesn't depend on any one factor, but there are a lot of things that you need to look for. Uh, the most important of them is the baseline findings. That is the baseline intraocular pressure that the patient has presented with, the baseline damage that the patient has presented with that includes the disc uh, structural changes as well as the functional changes on the perimetry. And along with this is the presence of other risk factors. That is, if there is a family history, and especially again in the family history, if there is a very strong family history, like you know, generations have been affected by glaucoma, or there is a significant visual handicap in the family, like loss of uh, you know uh, the vision and the visual fields and uh, uh, blindness in the family because of glaucoma. So all these factors put together then help to decide the target IOP. That is uh, higher the intraocular pressure, lesser the damage, then perhaps you can go with a higher target IOP. If the intraocular pressure is in the lower uh, ranges or maybe something like normal tension glaucoma or the disc damage is mild, then you can perhaps go with a, a moderate or high uh, level of uh, target intraocular pressure. So everything put together and again, what is uh, the lifestyle of the patient? What is the life? Uh, expected life expectancy of the patient, other comorbidities that the patient has, what are the drugs the patient is using. So everything, again, uh, helps to decide. If the patient is young, again, you need to have a lower target IOP. If the patient has lots of comorbidities and, uh, you know, not uh, very active and all that, you can again do with a higher target IOP. So uh, you mentioned everything. Just when you mentioned about the systemic medication. So can you elaborate in, in just a uh, few lines that what do you mean systemic medication? Yeah, uh, the one is if, I mean, there are two types of drugs that commonly, which are associated with glaucoma. One is, of course, the steroids. And if the patient is a steroid responder. And second is those systemic drugs, which are likely to affect uh, the vascular response of the eye and the vasculature. So mainly they are the hypotensive drugs. So if the patient is on hypertensive drugs and anything which is likely to further compromise the ocular perfusion, then in those cases, we have to treat aggressively and keep a, a balanced and a diurnally controlled intraocular pressure and a lower intraocular pressure. So the only, only thing I would like to add that if the patient is on systemic beta blocker, then usually we'll avoid uh, topical a beta topical blocker. Beta blocker yeah. uh, Parad, I think we all agree, you know, the first line is uh, the prostaglandin. You want to add any, what are the other factors you look when you, when you start the, the novice patient? We already have discussed SLT is one of the option, but usually we in India, SLT is uh, not that commonly used. Usually we still go for the, the medication. What are the factors uh, you look when you start the medications? The target pressure put Dr. Puri has already explained. I think unless uh, otherwise contraindicated, my first drug of choice would always be a prostaglandin. And there are so many advantages. They have the least systemic side effects. They have a very favorable dosage schedule. You know, they are extremely effective in uh, reducing the intraocular pressure. So unless they are absolutely contraindicated, like, you know, uveitic glaucomas or neovascular glaucomas, etc., where you want to avoid giving them uh, in the fear of increasing inflammation, I think you have to use prostaglandins as the first choice. Um, there's one uh, cosmetic problem that can happen is if, if it, there's a young patient who just has glaucoma in one eye, uh, sometimes, you know, you don't want to start with a prostaglandin because of, you know, they would get, feel the difference in terms of the lash lens and also the periocular pigmentation. So if it's bilateral, then it is more acceptable. Uh, in unilateral cases, sometimes it's a cosmetic issue. But like I said, uh, most of the times prostaglandins would definitely be the first choice. Cost. Uh, cost. 
cost you have so many generics also in india we have we are blessed to have you know so many generic medications yeah. generic uh, prostaglandin as well so the cost can vary anywhere between you know 700 800 per bottle to say 100 200 rupees per bottle so you have that wide range uh of of you know uh, prostaglandin uh, molecules that we are fortunate to have in india so if if the patient is not uh, so very affording then you can probably start with a, a generic version of a prostaglandin because rather than giving them something which is inferior i think it is better to start a prostaglandin even though it's a generic uh, prostaglandin and as we all know you know generics also you know based on your experience as to how effective they are in your uh, particular you know, practice you also have preferences regarding generics as well so you at the back of your mind you know which generics actually work well and which generics do not you know actually work that well so we all have our preferences for generics as well but i would again i would you know prefer to start a prostaglandin even uh, i mean probably a generic uh, prostaglandin uh, if if the cost is uh, of a significant issue anybody who wants to comment about the brand versus generic sunitha you want to take that question yeah. it is totally to it's a very controversial question <laughs> actually and we do have i in india the affordability is very poor i do agree I'm not against using generics but i think one thing should be kept in mind that the active ingredients and excipients are different in generic and branded if one is using branded and if one is switching to generic because of the cost factor then you have to look for the change in the because there can be you know difference in the iop reduction between the two so if you want to prescribe generic i think it should be the same brand the same uh, you know a uh, same brand so that you know how much is the reduction and you follow up the patient on that much of uh, you know the, uh, that brand only rather than switching between generic and branded then you will not have the idea how much is the reduction with generic and not I think I, I, I think uh, one more thing there is uh, what Dr Sunita said that uh, active ingredient is if you have to look for the other uh, ingredients also but other thing is if you give, if you are giving generic you must see which company or what you are giving because there is so much of variability from 75 there is a published literature which says that 75% to 300% variability in the drop size there is so much of and at whatever is labeled in the then in the generics number of times it is 20% less than what it is actually labeled uh, uh, there on the fr front uh, this thing and at any point in time the contamination is also more with the generics but especially the particulate contamination is more and uh, with increase in the temperature their efficacy also goes down so i think if you are giving generic and uh, if you are if we discuss about the cost the good generics are more or less at par with the brand and actually we have done small studies also and we have compared the generic versus in one eye versus the brand in other eye and believe me it is exactly the double the time that the brand actually uh, that the patient can use the brand because in generics there's a lot of variability with the compression a lot of drops will will be spillage and all this thing comes up so ultimately cost comes out to be uh, same so actually i prefer either brand good, or maybe good generic good good gen i think yeah. you but here the yeah and the you physician went, experience went, you mentioned is very very important so if you have experience with a generic which is you know yeah. doing its so the, job I, I reducing the pressures i just want to ask one for... question about this novelia because a lot of generics are coming up with novelia bottles so what is everyone's take on that and uh, because they they yeah, that... you know, the drop comes out uh, very in a very standardized uh, titrated way and uh, there's a different way of you know uh, uh, squeeze yes. The yeah, Novelia. using Novelia. Yeah, Rajul has good experience with that Novelia technology. Yeah. New, newer bottles are much better than the older one. The older bottles are very stiff. The newer yeah. Novelia bottles are you know, much easier to use, uh, and they are multi-dose preservative free. So, from Indian perspective, I think uh, the cost is taken care of and is preservative free. So, compared to yes. in India, cheaper. And I think one thing uh, because US uh, they have only two things: brand and generic. I think India we have three different. we are talking about brand brand generic and pure generic i think pure generics i i would never use uh, the brand good brand generic i think we are using it and we can continue uh, using that uh, so we have to know that which brand uh, generic we are using uh, okay the, let's go to the next thing uh, what are the specific things because we have uh, five minutes and we'll finish because we and otherwise we can just go on medical management for hours and hours and we'll not finish so in this sunday evening 
uh, and uh, for Ian is Sunday morning, so let him uh, go out and enjoy. Uh, what are the specific things you will have in mind uh, when you diagnose normal tissue glaucoma and start treatment? Will you do anything different than POAG and what? Uh, Purvi, you want to take the questions? I think um, this one. The Rupali, are you there, there or Rupali, are you there? Yeah, Rupali, you want to take that question? For normal tension glaucoma? Yes. Yes. So uh, one is to rule out that there is any IOP spike by make, doing a diurnal wherever possible. Make sure that they're not taking oral beta blockers or other medications which might be artificially masking and that there is no, uh, that the cornea is not terribly thin. Uh, wherever I think that there is likely to be a nocturnal dip or other things contributing, I like to get a 24-hour diurnal blood pressure also done. I don't always do any neuroimaging uh, for every patient. Uh, if the uh, other findings are very classical, like a, a more uh, saucerized disc with the defects which are close to fixation or typical of NTG, and if I'm convinced that the patient has a disc hemorrhage and is likely to get worse, then I will start on treatment. So, by the way, sleep apnea, any, any uh, uh, take on that? Uh, just a question for the panelists. Uh, do you ask them to you know, go for a sleep study where you think you know there's something you're missing and you know pressures are okay, fine, everything seems uh, otherwise to be you know okay, but the patient is progressing. So, would you advise uh, something like a I sleep study? Gotten. Yes, I have got some sleep studies done and I've uh, found only, uh, so we have nine patients I have who have got sleep apnea and uh, not all of them are progressing and I haven't had any change in their disease uh, subsequent to their starting CPAP, but CPAP has only been started for like 11, 12 months now. So it's too short a time to really say anything. Uh, like we somebody some... was saying, they feel better though. Their other uh, risks like their cardiovascular risks are... Uh, reduced so it's definitely worth looking for and we have a good sleep lab in Dinanath so that is uh, one good thing we have access to a good sleep lab. I think this is a new risk factor we have I have seen three four patients and two or three of them there's association of floppy eyelids also so they are obese patients with floppy eyelids and uh, sleep apnea and uh, so I think there is an association now so I think one should look for uh, sleep apnea in obese patients and especially patients who have floppy eyelids also. That was my observation. One point regarding the normal tension, I would just like to uh, add that uh, sometimes, you know, especially when it is, you know, unilateral disc change and feel change and, you know, sometimes practitioners just take it as normal tension glaucoma and they start treatment. But what uh, things you know, need to be ruled out is it could also be a burned out glaucoma. So that also mm -hmm. needs to be kept in mind that some episode might have happened in the past, you know, some blood loss or some surgery or maybe even some local ocular uh, pathology might have happened and that has uh, led to that uh, disc change and those changes and which have never further progressed. So that uh, also needs to be ruled out before starting treatment. And also uh, keep non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy you know, yes. non, non for non-tension glaucoma, especially in young patients. Uh, who have, you know, vision problem. There are so many risk factors wherein the red flags, uh, which will tell you to, you know, look for something else. So you always also keep that in mind. Actually, there's a huge checklist for normal tension glaucoma only when you tick everything off and then you end up with diagnosing it as normal tension glaucoma. Most importantly, you have done the gonioscopy. So we are hoping you have done the gonioscopy. Otherwise, Indian yes. Indian and ruler yeah. tank that closes. Yes. yes, yes. And all, all sort of glaucoma is uh, diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, gonioscopy is must. So I think, you know, we let's... Uh, Can I let's ask last question to Dr. Ian? Since he's authority on nanotechnology, I think this is just last sure. question because then we won't yeah, get the you, chance. You have the last question, then there are a few questions from audience. Yes, yes. Uh, I think yeah. everyone must be interested since we are talking of nanotechnology. And so, you know, we are dealing with nanomolecules here. So, uh, and uh, this, I think there are a number of shapes and size, some dextromers and some nano diamond or something. So do, mm -hmm. do you have any, any idea of what is the nanotoxicity, how these molecules, because they are basically meant to improve the penetration in the cornea or wherever yeah. the drug delivery, target delivery, delivery site. So also you have any experience with the, what is the nanotoxicity with that? So maybe we are not aware at this point of time at all about that. Yeah, I think th those all have to be evaluated. A lot of the, the formulations that are being made right now are made with um, 
compounds and, and, and for drugs or molecules that are used in the, in the body and have been, you know, evaluated as safe because there's a lot that goes into development and evaluation of these, but we do have to uh, kind of evaluate them separately in the eye um, because they can cause some inflammation there. But um, most of the molecules that are being developed are developed from, or the formulations that are being developed are developed from molecules that are generally regarded as safe within the, with people. But, you know, the FDA does require um, kind of a complete reevaluation for a lot of these, these formulations. So it's, it's, there's a lot of concern about the toxicity of these, these molecules or the potential toxicity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there are a few questions. One is that uh, whether pilocarpine is still an issue shortage or is it easily available? I thought it's easily available. It's, they've made it not easily available, available, but I think available. it's still available. Yeah. The second question was that is it uh, good to do baseline specular microscopy before you start patient on uh, uh, rock inhibitors? Mm. I, I haven't been. Um, we, we are I am doing now basal specular uh, microscopy or baseline. Every patient, space every patient on, uh, start, most of the patients. No, okay. certainly on patients before I operate and place a okay. tube or um, uh, now we're, we're considering doing it for some of our MIGS uh, procedures like the, the hydra stent okay. and, and other surgeries um, just to, to see um, and perhaps follow um, endothelial cell loss um, after our surgeries. Yeah, certainly. But I haven't been doing them um, before starting medications. Um, but I think there's, there's, you know, if we could, I'd love to get basal baseline specular microscopy in all my patients, you know, before SLT or any, any of these procedures, just to see how they affect the, the corneal endothelium. Okay, thanks. So the last question is that uh, any experience with ripasodil causing severe periorbital skin excoriation in uh, the um, uh, three patients she had, but all the patient was in maximum medical uh, therapy. Uh, so I, I think that, I don't think that is only repositorial is the cause. The patient is yeah. yeah. And, and in uh, lots of patients, we see that uh, uh, the, the preservative itself can cause uh, severe, or even uh, the skin excoriation. So but pruritus, I, 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 I like pruritus and erythema and this, uh, the, that blephritis is the known side effect of, uh, documented side effect of this thing, but definitely brimonidine okay. will, we will consider first. Okay. So I think it's 8.33 and we have overshoot our time. Uh, so I would like Anmol, uh, Anmol, if you can just play the small video, the, the entered people wanted to play small video about the company. And then we will just uh, close it. Anmol, are you still there? Yes. close the session i would like to thank uh, dr ian pitha uh, to spare a time on sunday morning uh, and thanks a lot for your uh, nice presentation okay. i would like to thank dr sri priya for um, uh, her talk uh, i would like to thank dr jignesh taswala and the whole mos for allowing us to do the this international webinars on the occasions of world glaucoma week under the mos uh, and all the panelists for sparing the time on uh, sunday evening it was a nice session. All the delegates, I think we had more than 200 people. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, we have two more sessions to go. We will be doing in the March end. I'll let you know, but it was a nice all, Dr. Daswala. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. It was thank a nice. Thank you, thank you very much.
I think they want to have some photograph or something. Gallery, like gallery view, photo, photo we always have at the end of the MOS session. I yeah, told yeah. Ash, uh, Mr. Ashwin, Anmol. Yeah, if you can uh, just... Just a word from, uh, a concluding remark from me, uh, Raju yeah, Lichu, sure. now. Yeah, please, uh, sir. Big thank you for conducting this uh, international webinar on the MOS platform. It is two way. We have also benefited in a big way. Uh, the, the webinar has been excellent. The discussion also has been very nice. You people, both of you conducted the moderate as moderators, a fantastic session. Question answers were asked to the point, and I'm sure the audience have definitely benefited. So we would like to have more about it as you had promised. Next week, I think we are going to have at the no, uh, no, March no, end, we are going March to have end. it. March end. So let's have it under the MOS next platform. Week. We continue the association with you people, and that'll be great. Thank you very much, each thank and every you, thank person. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank yes. you for motivating and being with us. <laughs> sure. And, and sure. Dr. Dignesh, keep up the good work. You're doing excellent work. I mean, a lot of uh, scientific sessions are being conducted by MOS. I hope yes. you keep yes. in the thank, thank, thank. Sports also. Sports also, but you're yes. keeping it in Pune. <laughs> you shouldn't be. You're <laughs> keeping it here also. No, it's not for you. It is Shefali. You come in <laughs> central zone. So, Dr. Uh, Swapnesh Samant has already conducted box cricket. Now, yesterday only I told Anaga Heru to take Kiss, over. Kiss, and, Kiss, and, and, out of my scope. <laughs> <laughs> kelo, kelo. <laughs> That'll be nice. Anyway, nice presentation. Beautiful. Yeah. The way it was conducted, it was excellent. On a Sunday evening, everybody has taken time out. And uh, Dr. Ian, on a Sunday morning there, we are about 12 hours, uh, the, the differences there. So thanks a lot, Dr. Ian, also. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, excellent. Very interesting panel discussion. That was, it yes. was really educational. A lot of points have come out. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Vian. Uh, Mr. Anmol, done? Yeah. I Has he taken a gallery view? Everybody have to keep your video on for him to take a proper gallery view. Okay. Yeah, he's taken. Yes, yes, yes it's, yeah. done. it's done. It's done. Okay. Hello. Bye bye. Thanks for done. Bye and take care. Thank you for the other sessions also. Sure, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Have Thank a good you. Night. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Have a nice day, Dr. Ian. Bye bye, Ian. Bye. Very bye. good day to you.